What do you love about being outside and active? I'm, I'm sure I've spent more time outdoors than in. That just feels like home. Enjoy what you can do because you never know what is around the corner. Just being outdoors in the fresh air, it just clears my mind. Fully immersed in nature is what brings me the most joy. Hello and welcome back to the Outside and Active podcast, where this week my special guest is Dr. Raf Alaya. Dr. Raf is a frontline doctor, a general practice resident, fitness trainer, and a well-being data scientist at the University College of London. Raf understands that everyone's fundamental target is to reach optimal quality of life, and through his experience of practicing medicine, doing evidence-based research on achieving the optimum well-being and one-to-one coaching personal training. Charismatic Dr. Raphael focuses on simply informing and inspiring audiences to take control of their well-being through evidence-based and sustainable methods, covering the domains of sleep, mindfulness, nutrition, health and exercise, bringing them all together as a package. He believes that holistic well-being is the key to quality of life, which he says we all deserve as a birthright. This podcast is really interesting and I thoroughly enjoyed having the conversation with Dr. Raphael Alaya about the data science side of things and also talking about AI and virtual reality and how important that is not only now but how important it's going to be in the very near future. Just before we jump into the conversation I just want to ask a quick favour from each of you. If each of you just takes literally 30 seconds to share this episode or share this podcast as a whole with someone who you think would enjoy it just as much as you then it will massively help uh, not only to grow the community but to help us just be able to do more of what we're doing now and keep continuing to bring on some amazing guests. Uh, Also in this podcast, I'm going to shout out the sponsor this week, Ellis Brigham, who we spoke about a little bit on previous episodes. Uh, So I'll chat about them a little bit later. But for now, let's jump straight into this conversation with Dr. Raphael Alaya. Raphael, I'm going to kick off this episode by offering you a piece of advice. And this piece of advice comes from previous guests on the podcast. And it is from a Winter Olympic and Summer Olympic commentator on the BBC called Ed Lee. He's also commentated on Ski Sunday. And his advice is, it's all about the people you surround yourself with, which I quite like. I quite like. Um, What's your reaction to that? And how important are your close circle of family and friends to you? That piece of advice really connects with me, you know, um, when I've ever been going through a hard time, whether it's through um, the challenges I've been facing academically or physically, if I'm doing competition or any type of pursuit, where I really, well, I'm really trying to push myself, being around people that have been through a journey like that before, or people that really want to see me succeed. But I think most importantly, people that, that believe in me to succeed. And I think that last one is really, um, quite powerful Mm. people that believe you can do what you say you're going to do or want to do because when they believe in you're thinking hold on i'm me and they're not me and they believe in me and they really seem to actually believe in me so maybe i can actually do it and it gives me that last bit of energy so yeah i I totally um you know love that piece of advice you gave i like that and the other opening tradition that we have is that i've asked this to every single person that comes onto the podcast is what do you love about being outside and active i love being outdoors and active because it feels like I'm connecting with something as natural as it can possibly be, something as organic as it gets in the world. And the more natural the environment, the better. You know, the more expansive, the more sort of um, there's something enigmatic and magnificent about being in a wide open space where you can't see anything man man made. You know, that um, picture behind you, that landscape, for me, it's conjuring up ideas and excitement to actually want to go work out in somewhere like that. You know, doing it reminds me of doing like ultra ultra marathon or forest gump running on a stretch of road where the only thing that's man made is the road itself, and it's really quite exciting being outdoors and active because I think something primal it, it wakes you up to be like, hold on, there's nothing, there's no difference between me and what humans would would have been doing thousands of years ago, and there's something amazing about that. I think it's really funny that you pointed out the um, the picture behind me because, and obviously people listening won't be able to see this, but it's um. It's, it's a person running through almost like a, a valley with mountains in the background. But if you look very closely, or if I can point there, the person that's running there is wearing jeans, which I find, <laughs> which, which we didn't notice when we first hung it up. But it's a person wearing jeans, which doesn't really make sense. But um, completely right. I think, like you said, they're connecting with, I think it's connecting with nature, being able to sort of just let go from, you know, 
the stresses that we have in modern life and being able to just write on whether it's going for a run or going for a walk or just catching up with a friend it's kind of that connection with with nature and connection with the outdoors which is so important um which is part of your life and I was kind of looking looking um around your socials and around what you do and thinking okay you do a lot you wear a number of different hats I mean uh, talk about jack of trades doctor athlete tv presenter explain to me and us how that works and how this has kind of come about there was a book that I read when I was at university. Uh, a friend, younger than me actually, I was only 21 at the time. He was in his first year, 18. And he said, I really love this book, Rap. I think you're going to like it. It was called, um, by Robert Greene, it was called, it slips me right now, but it's going to come to me before the end of this interview. <laughs> so I'm just keeping your toes. But this book really talked about how when different skills and different knowledge departments come together and it allows you to really see the world a lot more clearer and see what you're good at and try trying to listen to what naturally comes naturally to you in terms of enjoyment and in terms of what allows you to go into a state of ikagi or a flow state um, essentially being in a state where you can work really hard from the outside looking in but it doesn't seem to be a lot of effort for you and the more you can get into a state like that the more you can achieve your potential so how that links into why I'm do, doing so many things, I think I follow my interest and all the different things that I do, they're naturally related. And, you know, um, going deeper in one in terms of knowledge acquisition or developing my skills, mm. they help the other ones and they allow me to see things more clearly and they open my perspective and, uh, yeah, and they allow me to understand the world a bit more better and do my fundamental, my fundamental job as a doctor, yep. that's my bread and butter, that's my backbone. And it comes back to that, um, allows me to be a better doctor. I was going to, I'm glad you kind of said that these are your real interests because you, just looking at your social media and looking at what you do, these are your interests. These are something that you're passionate about. Obviously they're, they're work in, a, in definition, but things that you are genuinely interested in have been interested in for a long time because you've studied them. And I, I kind of wanted to know leading on from that, do they feed into each other in terms of skill sets you might pick up from one avenue feeds into the work that you do in another avenue? So you mentioned they are my work and objectively they, they are because you know I earn my living from them, but they don't feel like work. And whenever it starts to feel like work, it's quite hard for me to carry on doing it uh, or I just completely forget that it is work. And then even if I'm, it is quite stressful, you know, taking the concept of work out of my mind, whether it happens by purpose or by force, um, it allows me to enjoy it, even if it's quite stressful. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of that was my master's in data science. So data science is the backbone of artificial intelligence, essentially um, advanced statistics, and then using computers to do the hard work. But what we would have learned in GCSE maths, linear regression or line of best fit, um, put that, make it a bit more complex, got artificial intelligence. So I didn't actually study uh, maths at A-level. So, you know, I enrolled in the masters at, at UCL and it was really, it's meant to be quite hard to get into. You're meant to be either a PhD or, or wanting to do a PhD or, or have a statistics background. And I don't have that. But because I'm a doctor, it really helped my profile because they were like, okay, you must be good at studying. You must have aspirations in this field. So I didn't have a maths A-level. So derivatives and quite specific advanced topics that someone would expect to do an A-level. I didn't have. However, um, and I never classed myself as someone that was really good at maths, but because I wanted to, you know, acquire the knowledge that would allow me to use this skill, and, I, and it was really a natural desire, um, that, that kind of knowledge acquisition and learning, even though it was really stressful, you know, I, I, I paid for a teacher. I was putting more energy and effort into that than everything else in my life. I was really quite focused um, but it was coming out of me. I, I was being pulled towards it as opposed to pushing myself. So, um, you know, so it's never really felt like work. And whenever it does feel like work, naturally, I, I, I move away from it. For example, you know, working as a doctor in the NHS, um, sometimes the jobs can be quite laborious and there's a lot of um, hierarchy um, and ad administration. You know, I'm sure you've heard you know, a lot of doctors are, are burnt out. Mm, um, right. And as soon as that becomes part of my day-to-day -day job, of course, every job has 
uh, mundane stuff. But when it becomes a bit too much for me, for example, if it's, if it's going on for more than six months or one year in, or one year in the job I'm doing, I won't be able to help myself but move away from it and do something else. So, um, so coming back to the question that you asked, can you just remind me of what it was again? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's talking about um, kind of your, following your interests and also how some may play into each other. So say the work, obviously, like you said, your bread and butter being a doctor, how that also might feed into, um, you know, the, the characteristics and the skills you learn from doing that, which is obviously fast, do you take into into being, you know, presenter and being on TV and also some of your academic research as well. There's kind of overlapping things there. Just jumping in quickly to tell you a little bit about this week's sponsor of the Outside and Active podcast, Ellis Brigham. Now, thank you, Ellis Brigham. They have sponsored a few of the episodes recently and, well, they're athlete tested and expedition proven, especially this new product, which you can check out. It's the new Summit Series from the North Face, which redefines backcountry snow sports clothing using Gore-Tex Pro for durable, waterproof, and breathable performance, guaranteed. And you can see this on the Ellis Brigham website. Uh, There is a link in the description of this podcast. Make sure to go and check them out. I remember the book that I mentioned at the start. (laughs) Let's come back to you. Mastery by Robert Greene. His popular, his most popular book is um, 50 Laws of Power or um, 48 Laws of Power. And he did, a, he did a book for 50 Cent, another book called um, The Laws of Seduction. But for me, Mastery. And then another book that is really important for this question is another book I read that really influenced me. I feel this book was actually almost based on Mastery. Have you ever read a book and you're thinking, hold on, a lot of the concepts here are from that book? Or. And then you realize which book was was, was written first. <laughs> we read that. A lot, a lot of these books, a lot, a lot of these books recycle concepts. But um, and I guess some of these concepts are universal. But anyway, um, the second book is called The Medici Effect. And the Medici Effect was looking at how what, what, what we might call Renaissance men um, combine different skills and different knowledges. You know, the, the typical archetype for the Renaissance man is Leonardo da Vinci. You know, artist, painter, mathematician, anatomist, and um, how he was able to you know come up with new concepts because of that. And that idea of being a Renaissance man it swept me away. I was I was so enthusiastic about it, and it, I was thinking, hold on, with what's available with us today, the knowledge, the internet, we can really do anything we want, and the the concept or the possibilities of innovation are, are mind boggling. But we just need to apply ourselves. So. Coming back to the specific question of how the different uh, areas of my life um, help each other. So the areas are uh, medicine, um, as an emergency medicine doctor, and uh, primary care, uh, GP. And um, secondly, a data scientist, which is the core skill behind artificial intelligence engineering. And then number three, um, showbiz, I'd say, uh, presenting or, or showmanship or performance on stage. And then lastly, um, being an athlete. And I think all of us are somewhat athletes. You don't need to be a professional. You, know, you could be a weekend warrior as long as it's an important part of your life. You know, I, I see some of the... A good, a good example of of an athlete that I guess wouldn't be seen as an athlete is, you know, I was in obstetrics and gynecology um, uh, a few weeks ago just assisting the obstetrician the, the, the doctor that delivers the babies who's a surgeon and i'm not a surgeon but i was assisting them just um they were telling me what to do mm. and um i was thinking they do this day in day out and they stand on their feet for up to six hours and some surgeons maybe up to even even more than that and they might be in their 60s or even older if they've got a lot of experience and standing up up for that long i i probably wouldn't be able to do it without complaining and they do it without complaining so in some ways they're an athlete and their body's um, they've trained their body to be able to do that and not complain, not just physically but mentally, which is a very important part of it. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah. So, medicine, artificial intelligence, um, um, and then being an athlete, yeah. and then lastly presenting. So, presenting that's really communication and presenting myself and presenting ideas at the level that are best to um, communicate with who I'm talking to. So that of course, is important for everything, especially 
the most possibly complex area, which is uh, the data science or the medicine. When I'm speaking to patients that perhaps don't understand or do understand, there's a lot of people, I, what I find is that they don't want to be talked down to. You know, okay. the typical situation I find is, you know, like a lawyer or an engineer or a teacher or um, people that have studied academia to an extent or just quite well read. Mm. They really want to know as much as possible. And I think that's great. Um, so it's more of a partnership. So yeah, this commu- the science of effective communication. And then not just that, but communicating in an enthusiastic, enjoyable way. So people, they enjoy you communicating in and of, it, of itself, which is um, you know really quite a deep thing inside all of us. You know, sometimes we just like the way people communicate and it can make the communication really enjoyable. And then being an athlete, for me, you know, it's there's something kind of primal about pushing your body to the limit or understanding your body um, in, in in such a practical way. And I think nothing can ever replace it. Um, nothing can, can, can be in its place. Um, and also, you know, stress relief and understanding what people at the top of their game, you know, professional athletes, people that are the best at the different things that they do, Having a taste of it, of course, I'm not the best athlete in any particular uh, sport or, or thing, but um, being able to push my body to the limit, there's something similar that I'm feeling that, that they felt. And also competition. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a competitor. I love to compete um, from everything I see as a bit of a competition, and I enjoy it. You know, I lose, and I win, and I draw, and you know, I love the process. I think knowing how to take losses well as an athlete is, is, is an important process and a, a, a part, an important part of maturity. And um, sometimes, you know, relishing your loss, but always thinking, oh, I could possibly win in the future. So being an athlete, that's that. Um, artificial intelligence and data science is really, it ha- helps you think more clearly and logical. Um, but also in that, it helps you understand that, you know, we think numbers can be black and white, can be completely objective. But really, if you understand numbers and you know how to skew them, they can be twisted and turned into what you want them to be. And then that highlights and it makes you more skeptical of everything. Um, and then, you know, medicine, of course, it, it gives me a privilege to be listened to. People trust me um, and it allows me to, you know, um, have, a, have a level of um, authority in everything that I do. So, um, and then lastly, to be the athlete and presenting, of course, I think, you know, I'm being associated with a BBC, a CBBC, yeah, um, these you know great organisations gives me you know more uh, you know presidents to push things forward, and um, and it's great fun as well, um, <laughs> especially yeah dealing with kids. Um, if you're not real and in the moment, and if you're not um, if you don't connect to them, because sometimes you can think, oh, the camera's in front of me, and it, you can be too presenterish, but kids can see okay. straight through. Yeah, and that, that links into you know if you're ever dealing with kids as a doctor or in any position where you need to connect with them, if you if you don't have the correct energy, they can feel it right away. So um, kids kids TV presenting is a lot of fun and it keeps it keeps things real because you know regardless of the amount of money that might be involved or um, the the level that it's at or the amount of people watching or the followers or the prestige of the event, kids only see the energy that you present. So it keeps things real. I find that really interesting because you you kind of through that you've you've spoken about dealing with people of high level in you know like you said the lawyers and the doctors and the, all those type of people and having those conversations with stakeholders and and that being part of your work but also having that you know working with kids presenting and doing that side of things is shows your range of ability to be able to communicate with a wide range of stakeholders so is that something you've had to adapt to over time and something that maybe just comes naturally to you? In all the exploits, in all the areas that I've been trying to push forward in my life, um, they've been pushed forward by by opportunities that are quite stressful and have an element of competition or element of performance. So for example, naturally um, in a medical career, you have exams and you're compared to your peers and you're constantly judged in being um, competent. So there's that stress that comes with it. And then in, and that, that's what keeps me good for uh, presenting. I'm with my twin brother, who's also a great performer as well. So I can't slack. 
because otherwise I look silly next to him. Not just that, you're in front of people and you're going to be judged by people watching. So, um, and lastly, as, as an athlete as well, I'm always comparing myself to people at the best because although although I'm not the quickest or the strongest, I'm not I'm not too far away. I'm I'm within, for example, on my bench press for how for how heavy I am. You know, I'm, I can bench like 150 kilograms at um, at 85 kg. So that's within range, a reasonable range. It will be respected by a professional athlete, for example. Um, so that's that competitive nature as well, isn't it? Absolutely. So, um, so what was the question again? Just about uh, being able to communicate with different stakeholders, anything from, you know, real high level conversations like you touched on earlier about you know, con- conversations with lawyers and, and, and your peers around you, but also TV presenting with kids is quite a change from that. Yeah. So how I was bringing that back to the question is that in each of these areas, the proof is in the pudding with how well you communicate. For example, if you, if you don't communicate well in medicine, then your performance will show because people, a lot of what people see as a good doctor is someone being nice to them and then being able to understand what the doctor's saying, not really what happens at the end. Of course, what happens at the end, and whether they did good medical treatment is very important, but what they see, so whether, you know, so that pushes me and to communicate well as a doctor. Um, or data science, um, because I'm at the intersection between you know, pure specialists, kind of engineers, and then people that are more on the outcome side or um, on the how to use this information to make decisions. I'm naturally, um, I naturally do that. And for, for, for the, for the TV presenting, there's, the proof is in the pudding. So it'll be a very direct um, analysis and evaluation of how good you are depending on how well you communicate. So that constant negative feedback or positive feedback, if you did it good, is always a part of my Mm. life. So naturally, that would happen to anyone. You know, you want to fail fast, fail fast. You know, there's been times, you know, let's say five years ago, where we were put in front of cameras on on a a high level in front of the BBC, and they would say, you know, let's see what you've got. I'm a lot better now. I'm I'm a lot more relaxed. So that fail fast and fail quickly is... And learn from your mistakes is, is is what really is important when it comes to communicating well. So I, I definitely wasn't I wasn't a natural. It's just because I've been dropped in the intensity or failing fast. What I'm really fascinated to hear about is how good your time balancing skills and also energy is. Because I have a, a two or three of my really close friends that study medicine that I believe are in F2 now, if I'm getting the terminology right. Who yeah. their time is they have none. Uh, they are tired all the time that what they're you know doing work-wise is really busy and we've also had Priya Kapowdas on this um, podcast as well who I know is is um, extremely busy but then fits in time to do her ultra running and stuff like that you're balancing quite a lot here alongside your job so how do you manage that quote from Jason Diamond uh, the, the CEO of JP Morgan you know he says um, you can do everything just not all at the same time um, I'm doing quite a lot at the same time, but a lot of it is accumulative, and not would not be what I'm doing currently right now. And sometimes what I'm doing right now, there'll be a level of intensity. But the other things that I do, the accumulation of what I've done in over the past few years, looks like I'm doing it now. Um, it's important to say, you know, your friends that are doing F2, um, which is the second year of actually graduating after after medical school, um, it's very intense. Working full-time as a doctor for the NHS, it's very hard to do extra things. You probably have the capacity to do two extra things. One of them could be like a relationship or family. Other one could be, you know, something else. If you're good at time management, you can't really do much more than that, I think. Um, I'm not full-time. I've been uh, 50%, I've been 100%, I've been 18 60%. So um, that really gives me a lot more capacity. Um, but the job as a doctor, depending on, on, on what job it is, is, yeah. is like labor. It feels like labor sometimes. <laughs> well, it is labor. Um, but yeah, m- my time management, I have the tendency to get obsessed and laser focused on something um, for that for that time being. And then you just need to keep everything else above the threshold. For example, fitness is a great example. For me, I don't want something like my bench press or my 400 meter time to go below 
a certain level because it's very hard to get it back. Mm. Or like my body fat, which, you know, it can happen. It can, your body fat can go up very quickly and then it affects your performance. So you need to keep things above a threshold. So understanding what your trigger points are on how to balance things so you don't need to invest too much time, but it keeps you at that level to maintain. That's what you need. If you stop doing the data science stuff or stop reading papers, you're going to fall behind. And before you know it, you're going to be like, okay, I'm almost at a beginner level again. Um, and, and medicine as well. You know, you can easily forget how quickly the knowledge of attrition happens. If you take a holiday for literally two weeks, the things that you wouldn't even think of are important to your knowledge and your fast thinking when you're on the job. But you'd be like, oh, wow, what's the dosage of that? What's that? And you're checking everything and second guessing yourself. So, um, but yeah, keeping everything above the threshold. But, but, but usually I'm focusing on one thing, which is one of those things that requires a lot of intensity um, and, and drive. And then everything else, you just keep it ticking along. Just segueing into something that I know is something that you research and you're interested in. You've mentioned a couple of times data science and that aspect of what you do. And we've really seen kind of in in widespread society the introduction of AI. I know it's been longer than this, but really over the last year or two, where it's becoming a lot more accessible. Um, and it's something that you've researched and I'm and, and VR as long along with that. I'm just interested to hear about your thoughts of how that plays into especially around technological innovation in healthcare and and education and how that is sort of striding forward. Revolution is going on right now in healthcare all around the world. UK uh, in the top five nations pushing this forward. And there's a lot more, there's a lot of flexibility, money investment and, and bright ideas and, and, you know, innovation thinkers or thought leaders in, in the AI space. So, um, and I've been part of that, you know, space being at UCL. Um, so, you know, I feel this revolution very, very deeply. I feel like, hold on, the decisions that are made now and the organizations and the companies and the startups that, that are going to be made now in this period are going to shape the future. So there's negative forces. There's forces that are more focused on the commercial interest of companies, yep. for example, how much money they can make, as opposed to, you know, how can we make health technology more, equitable in terms of how do we spread the technology to make sure as many people across the social economic strata of society benefit from this as opposed to just the people that can afford it because a lot of the time i've seen that the cutting edge technology that is you know mind-blowing often it's only the people at the top of society that know about it not just know about it but can afford it and then know people that will um supply it to them and, and, and give them the treatment if it's treatment you know, we have the, the space of longevity, longevity medicine um, coming out, which is, you know, going to extend people's lives, you know, into the hundreds. So and if only a certain section of society are benefiting from that, that's quite, that's an ethical issue. It's really an ethical issue, um, you know, which, which has, which will have compounding effects. So I feel this very deeply. I understand it. I've seen it. So I, I want to be part of that to make, to influence it in the right direction. and. Um, because there's this societal debate around people thinking, oh, AI is going to be this 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 amazing thing, or AI is going to be always going to take all of our jobs, and it's going to it's going to be a negative impact on the society. You've seen how it can have some tremendous positive impacts. Definitely, yeah. And you know, examples are radiology. I think that's a quite easy example where X-rays and CT scans and MRI scans can do the job of a professional that's trained for fifteen years. Um, you know, there's more complex examples where, you know, in hospitals, there's so many decisions that go on, um, and simplifying that can save so much time, money, and lives as well. And the doctor, instead of doing managerial stuff, managerial tasks like I, I mentioned was the boring part of being a doctor, and actually steers people away from medicine. That can be just the computer or the AI, and yeah. the doctor can focus on how do we use those um, calculations that the AI made to make this person's life better. Because a lot of the time, with those subjective or emotional, or more human-to-human -human, um, decisions that are made, a computer a computer is never going to be able to do that, at least in the, in, in, in the short term ahead of us. So, um, yeah, artificial intelligence is here now, it's happening. There's still a long way to go. Yeah. Those decisions are being made now, so what the future looks like is going to be decided by now, and I feel that very deeply. I was having this with the same friends that I spoke about that um, they're in now F2 and a couple of other friends that aren't in medicine, 
had this slight tongue in cheek debate a few years ago around one of our friends saying, "Oh, in a few years, your jobs, your you know, medicine doctor jobs, it'll, it'll be doctors. You know, they'll take over every, everyone's roles." Will and interesting, you just reminded reminded me there of you saying around actually they will use it as a supplementary as a help to be able to kind of make those individuals real life individuals jobs more effective and more accurate that's kind of like kind of what you're saying there yeah and make the job of a doctor be what be more of what it should be yeah which is um more about how do we help this person lead a better life enjoy their life better whether it just be a longer life or a more fruitful life which sometimes can be somewhat worlds away from the numbers on the screen and you know that's where the humor side comes into it um Otherwise, being a doctor is a bit of a technician. You know, you're working machinery to an extent, and that's not what really what we that's not what we signed up for. Mm. We signed up to help people. Well, I did anyway. I think most doctors did, um, in in the most direct way possible. How do your experiences, your knowledge, what you've studied, what you do, impact the way that you live your own daily life? Whether when it whether it comes to looking after yourself and health and fitness and well-being and that type of thing. I'm more skeptical of technology. I'm more skeptical of products. I'm more skeptical of, well, skeptical has got a negative connotation. I say I'm more, I evaluate more and I I feel I can see through to the truth of what someone's saying or or what someone's objective is, whether it be a company or someone trying to influence the people around them or or to get to a point, especially with, um, data science, um, you know, reading research papers, you know, often a good example is during the COVID uh, pandemic, when it, when it came to making decisions about what sh- should we do with this patient, what, what medication should we give, no one really knew what to do. And there were research papers coming out and they were heralded as, oh, this new drug. But then when you read the paper fully from start to finish and you need to spend maybe two hours doing it or, or more, you see, okay, here's the, here's the weaknesses and strengths of the study. The decision is a bit grey, but then if you just read the conclusion, the odds can seem quite clear, but it's it's really quite wrong, and it might not even apply to the patient that you're dealing with. So that's quite an elaborate example, but extrapolating that back to my day-to-day life, I think I'm able to see things a lot more clearer. Almost a bit like being Neo in the Matrix, <laughs> where you're seeing the Matrix for yourself, you see the numbers go up and down, um, and then you know being a bit more philosophical. Um, despite all the technical things I do, I think you see situations in hospital where the technical side or the science of it is on one side, and then just the pure human side is what's most important. For example, it can be this life-saving treatment, but it's going to be stressful, it's going to be painful. The person's already 99, they have no family, they have no friends, they're at peace. Why do you want to do that? You know? Um, complicated world <laughs> but it it's, it's it's interesting to see i mean obviously you know this is your life this is what you research and this is what you know about of of in very interesting to see where it's it's going to go and as someone who kind of just kind of gets the the top line level stuff it is very interesting ai and and virtual reality and all of these type of things i'm I, i'd like to feel positively about it i'd like people to feel positively about it but obviously it's such an un in society, it's an unknown at the moment, so it's very interesting to see where it's going to go. And it's interesting to hear you talk about it and your opinions on it. I kind of want to switch back from from thinking about that and that philosophical point to um, going back to TV presenting very quickly because I'm interested in how that kind of actually started. You mentioned there about getting that um, not afraid to fail and those 10,000 hours of presenting in first so that you're comfortable where you are now. But where was that sort of first phone call? What was that first experience where you were then in front of camera and doing things like that? enough i didn't actually say ten thousand hours but i totally agree with it obviously you've been reading um, in and around these books that i've been talking about um where did it start me and dan have always been on stage performing from, from the beginning um you know, when we were you know um in secondary school we did a public speaking competition every year and you know we had some really critical teachers and um, tutors you know um we spent hours doing it and it wasn't really didn't, it didn't seem like work because we were competing with each other, me and Dan, and it was more, it was competition um, against other schools as well. 
And then <clears throat> theatre at university, I got a few main parts. And then because we, we, we constantly surrounded ourselves by this performing world, it gradually developed. And then, you know, before we knew it, a few production companies were like, okay, you're doctors, you seem quite fun, you have this kind of young energy which other presenters don't have, and obviously your, your knowledge in medicine, let's see what we can do with it. So it kind of snowballed um, in amongst our other work. Um, and then opportunities really came from there. But I think the, kind of the professional level um, career path has been been paved out since we were maybe 14 years old. Interesting. Okay. And, and uh, sorry, just how old are you now then? If you're, you're saying that was sort of at 14, but roughly are you sort of mid, mid, late, mid 20s, early 20s? 31. 31. No. Well, there we go. Yeah, There's, no, there you Wait, go. It's all of that time in the gym. <laughs> It's, it's a good job I didn't shave you this morning, otherwise I wouldn't have been 25. <laughs> but interesting you say it's kind of been laid out from that. I mean, obviously having that natural, again, go back to passion and interest, but also having the the uh, the, the quality of it as well and um, comes together of you then having that plan laid out for you and and, uh, sure. and following it and, and intertwining it with what you're currently doing. I mean, the other thing that we kind of touched on the beginning is that athlete side and and wanted to hear more about what you do from the fitness side. You've said about the gym, but also know that you played basketball and rugby at university as well. So that must have been a big part of your life. Yeah, university, I was great. I was at Liverpool um, for my first degree and then UCL. Um, and those different dynamics. Liverpool was more DIY, do it yourself. <laughs> Everyone was, was a bit, it was a bit more level headed. Yeah. UCL, um, the, the, the demographic was a little bit more prestigious. And that, came, that comes with its own benefits and advantages as well and understanding, okay, there's a lot more competition here and your network um, can contribute to your net worth. And just knowing people, being in certain situations, it opens up doors. Um, and everyone's very aware of that, I feel, at UCL. Um, but Liverpool, it's not that it's, that's not the case at all. It's like you're at university, have fun, enjoy yourself thoroughly. This city is cheap. Um, and do your degree on the side as well. Um, the rugby and basketball. So yeah, do you still do you still play rugby and basketball now, or is it more gym focused and other other elements? No performance, yeah. So um, rugby. Um, I, I still play rugby. Um, for UCL, um, um, men's fifteen. Um, my last game was about three weeks ago against LSC. I play thirteen outside centre, um, and that really directs my gym training as well. Yeah, and because you know, without it being needed for performance, it's more for aesthetics which is fine, but it's harder to keep yourself motivated. Because if you think to yourself, me pushing myself a little bit more means our team can win. And especially with such a sport like rugby where the camaraderie and that teamwork and work together with your fellow comrades, I love that aspect of rugby. I don't think anything else is on that level. I mean, I'm not really a, foot, uh, a soccer player or a football player, but rugby for me, there's nothing else that gives you that camaraderie feeling. Absolutely. Did you, did you watch the World Cup? Yeah, I loved it, yeah. Watch the final? Who did you want to yeah. win? Um, definitely um, New Zealand. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. I agree. Well, yeah. And I think anyone got that good to uh, Yeah, I don't think anyone did. Um, no. I just wanted to finish, thank you for that. I just wanted to finish off by asking um, some pr practical advice. I like sometimes people that are listening to take away, obviously I've learned a lot from what you've been speaking about and I've found it extremely informative. Um, but just some little things that people can maybe apply to their own lives um, tomorrow and a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, and I know you could speak about it for ages, but I wanted to ask you, how can we can take control of our will, well-being sustainably? And I kind of use the word sustainably because it's, it can sometimes be easy of us to see a oh, four-week fad diet or do this so that it only lasts for weeks, days, a couple of months, and then you go back to kind of reverting to the way you were before. So how can we can take, trolls, take control of our well-being in a more sustainable manner? Yeah, good question. One way to take control of our well-being in a more sustainable manner is to focus on level of performance. For example, a sharp example is someone wanting to run the 400 meter race or the 5K or whichever race they want in under a particular time period because you're not saying, I'm going to lose this much weight or you're not saying, I just want to do this every day. You're constantly improving and it's something which is a bit of a stretch goal. And in doing that, you build up the mental power or the fortitude or the habit cycle to continue doing it. And then the most important part, the 
internal locus of control of of behavior um, becomes more part of who you are instead of what you want to be. For example, if someone says, for me, for example, I want to run the, the, the 400 meter in under 55 seconds. Currently, I'm about one minute. I'm, I'm just on one minute. So for me to run under uh, 55 seconds, I'm probably going to, that's going to be probably six weeks of training. But by, by the end of the six weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm a seasoned runner of that race, a bit of a specialist as far as an uh, amateur can be. So through, as opposed to, I want to lose this much body fat, because once you lose that body fat, um, there's many different ways to do it. But, and then what? You know, you achieved your goal. Um, and yeah, you could say after you run under 55 seconds, you've achieved that goal. But the habit is already built, and that's the most important thing. Mm. You know, if losing a particular amount of body weight or being in a certain shape helps you build that habit, then fair enough, that's fine. But some um, some routines don't actually build the habit or the or the mental uh, the mental platform where you think, okay, I'm a runner, I'm someone that takes care of their diet. That's who I am. I'm not trying to be it. And when you start seeing yourself as someone as that's just who you are, then it becomes easier. You know, I'm a stylish person, so I don't need to think about it. I could be wearing something very plain. I'm not talking about myself here. I'm just talking generally. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone sees themselves as a fashionable person. They can be wearing anything. Well, I'll pull it off in such a way where it becomes stylish. Um, as opposed to, I'm going to try and be stylish today. You see what I'm saying? I see what you mean. I see what you mean. And there's a lot of this stuff that you're talking about that's down to mindset as well and building not only physical improvements, for want of a better phrase, but also that habit and that, strong mentality side of things it's building mental fitness as well as physical fitness um yeah, and yeah that quote, helps there's a quote from one of my heroes when it comes to self-development uh, greg plitt you heard of him? greg plitt no yeah. but he's on my list now yeah, what's please. the quote um amongst other quotes he says something along the lines of you never burn out physically because you always burn out mentally so for me, what that means is that whenever you're doing something, you want to get as close as you can to burning out physically because often we stop because we don't have the mental fortitude. So whenever we stop before our body actually gives out, of course, we don't want to be dangerous. We don't want to you know, collapse on a treadmill. What I'm saying is that keep pushing yourself until you have to stop and you know there's always a little bit more. There's a great video of Steve Redgrave during his training for the Olympics um, if anyone's ever seen it, of training extremely hard on the the indoor rowing erg. And it kind of reminded me of that when you're saying, obviously you don't want to be dangerous and push yourself to the point where you actually physically burn out because I agree with you. You mentally do stop before you physically stop. There's a video of him training really, really hard. I don't know how long the time period was. Finishes, either it's his distance or the amount of um, time he's going, and then he just absolutely collapses onto the floor. And it made me think, okay, that this guy will go to anything, but shows that his mental barrier and his physical barrier were on almost an equal point of he will push himself until the point where he is you know, passing out. Another quote um, is, not a quote, just kind of a metaphor, um, consistency is a lot more important than intensity. Oh, I like that. I like that. Oh, that's really good. That's really good advice. And I completely agree. I completely agree, which actually leads me on nicely because I'm about to ask you for a piece of advice and you've offered so many, including that one, but you can't use that one again. So I'm going to ask you for a different one. Um, but just quickly, uh, thank you so much for all the information that you've provided. And, and I've found it extremely interesting hearing about uh, what's brought you to kind of where you are now. Um, what's next for you? And also where can people go to find out more information about you, but also what's next? You can find out on my on my website. Uh, I publish all my pursuits academically and professionally with TV and research on my website, um, RaphaelOlea.com. And on my social media, um, some entertaining things on there and everything we're doing. And upcoming, we've got um, Operation Ouch, a new series, um, which is going to go all over the world. Um, it won't be back this, hopefully we win another BAFTA, Operation Ouch. And then we got two live stage shows, um, one on space medicine, how to survive in space, and then the second one is um, the superstars of the history of medicine. So we're going to do a tour. Um, keep posted. And my email address, if you want to contact me, I'm really responsive um, on my email. If you want to get involved in the research or if you've just got a question, 
Uh, my email address is rafaelolea1 at gmail.com. So, um, so get in touch if you want to. And yeah. Thank you. All those links will be in the podcast description and the article and stuff like that. And definitely implore you to go and search out more. Um, the final thing I want from you, I offered you a piece of advice at the beginning from the uh, Olympic commentator, Ed. And now is your opportunity to leave a piece of advice for not only the listeners, but someone coming onto the guest as a, onto the podcast as a guest in the near future. When you are self-promoting yourself, promote yourself as if you're your biggest fan. Always promote yourself as if as if you're your biggest fan because that will make other people your fan and no one else is gonna do is gonna do it as good as you. And it will open up doors and just the confidence of promoting yourself. And when it comes from your heart, it doesn't seem arrogant. It doesn't it doesn't seem self inflammatory. Um, it seems like okay, this person backs themselves and just the fact that you back yourself is one of the most important parts of it. Because it's like, hold on, if this person fails, they think that they can win and eventually they'll get there. And often you need to fail before you win. And as with everything you've said in this podcast, that is a great way to tie it all up in an iceberg. And I look forward to passing it along. Dr. Raphael, thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Doc. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the ONA podcast featuring my special guest, Dr. Raphael Alaya. Thank you, Dr. Rafa, for coming on to this podcast. Um, some really interesting topics of conversation here, and he speaks so eloquently and so well, and, and I found it such a gripping conversation to have. I mean, it's not something that I know overly well. I, I think a lot of you know the general public know a lot about data science, and we know that artificial intelligence is growing, and virtual reality has been here for a while, but what does it actually mean for us and how important is it and where is it going? So thank you, Dr. Raphael, for giving us a, a little bit of an insight into that. I'll ask you for a little bit of a favor at the beginning of this episode. Uh, and I'd like to repeat that. If you haven't done so already, then please do share it with someone who you think would enjoy it just as much as you. If not this episode, then maybe there's another episode that you have listened to or about to listen to that you think someone would enjoy just as much as you. It literally takes 30 seconds to share it and I promise it means so much uh, and affects so much uh, when you do it. So please, thank you for doing that in advance. Um, thank you to Ellis Brigham for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Uh, we'll we'll hear more from them in, in future episodes, uh, but make sure to check them out in the description of this podcast. That's all for this week. I'll be back next week with another episode on this podcast. Looking forward to it and looking forward to you joining us. I've been Dominic Brown. Enjoy the outdoors. Enjoy the outdoors.